You've only got one machine, one probe, and one shot. If you are the only one who knows how to use ultrasound, then you are the expert. You are listening to Soundwaves from the Community with your host, Dr. Tyler Deshaun. All right, everyone, welcome to the Soundwaves from the Community podcast. I'm your host, Tyler Deshaun, and today we have a special episode. Joining me today is a special guest. He's the first guest on the podcast. He is an ultrasound director in the community up in Denver, and he did his training at um, Denver Health Residency, which is a four-year program. And during his fourth year, he actually did some research on biliary studies and repeat studies in the ED and the effects on the clinical course of their patients. He is also the father of two awesome children and a loving husband. He also is a part-time farmer, owning several chickens and a dog. In his spare time, he also likes to brew his own coffee, or <laughs> he likes to brew his own beer and roast his own coffee. He's also an outdoor enthusiast, like a lot of people in Colorado. And of note, he also joins us, several, or he's been with us as a faculty member for several years on our procedure course and the ultrasound section. And so it's my, um, it's my honor to introduce our special guest today, Dr. David Bosch. David, how's it going, man? It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being on the show. And so David is with us today because he's an expert in fascia iliaca blocks. He's helped establish an amazing program up there in Denver with his group, and they've seen a lot of results with their patients. And again, this is a community setting. This is not academics. And so we just want to kind of run through that. So David, if you've got a case for us, and then if you can kind of give us a little bit of background on how you got the program started and how things are going for you. Yeah, absolutely. So my case is a uh, pretty typical case. I think we see a lot. It's a 70 year old male with a history of dementia, CHF and diabetes who would present to the ED early in the morning after getting up in the middle of the night and falling. Uh, he was found by his family members a couple hours later was claiming only of right hip pain. Uh, so he's brought in by ambulance, unable to bear any weight. Um, his past surgical history is only remarkable for a previous uh, left hip surgery that did not go well for the family. Um, his vital signs were normal. He had no other uh, trauma. And uh, on examination, his uh, right hip was shortened. It was externally rotated and pain with any kind of range of motion, um, neurovascularly normal. Uh, the case I thought was interesting because this happened early in the morning, right prior to sign out. Uh, it was going to be several, probably half an hour uh, to 45 minutes before he could get x-rays to confirm a fracture and the patient is in a lot of pain. Uh, and so uh, before uh, the patient went for x-rays, I was waiting for him in the, uh, in the room as the EMS crew kind of rolled in uh, with the ultrasound machine, with my block kit and my nice. anesthetic ready to go. And uh, after he got off the gurney, after I examined him and uh, family members were there to get verbally consent me, uh, I did a fascia like a block uh, before I left the initial room, uh, evaluation room. Wait, uh, wait. So you're telling me you did a fascia iliaca block before the x-ray. Is that right? Yes, sir. Man, Absolutely. that's awesome. Getsy, yeah. but awesome. All right. Excellent. So how did things yeah. go from there? Well, things went great. You know, by the time he actually went down for x-rays, which are painful procedures, he had a drastic reduction in his pain. Uh, he had a femoral neck fracture, which was obvious on his exam. Uh, and he went uh, and went on to be admitted to the hospital and had a, a very typical uh, hospital course with minimal pain management. Had to give him no pain medications otherwise in the emergency department. Nice, nice. So so no narcotics and no Narcan, no. is that right? Correct. Excellent, correct. excellent. And yeah. that's, I mean, that's why we do old point of care ultrasound, right? We do what's best for the patient. And you could identify that this patient needed pain control. Um, you know, he needed an x-ray eventually, but before that, wanted to get the pain under control. So why do something that could be, you know, potentially risky for his respiratory status or anything like that? You know, addiction, opiate addiction is huge. So, uh, so that's phenomenal. And so tell me, so how did you get the fascia iliac uh, uh, block program or femoral um, nerve block program started at your institution? Uh, it started just based on me doing several and then getting raised eyebrows from our surgery, surgery fellows. Uh, uh, they, yeah. <laughs> they, uh, they did, didn't really know what they were. And uh, as they started getting uh, admissions with folks who've had blocks, they started asking, you know, wh what we were doing. Um, and, and shortly thereafter, I, I presented the data to my group uh, um, and tried to explain you know, to the group how this was kind of 
my thinking was this was going to be kind of the way to treat pain management, uh, kind yeah. of treat hip fractures. Um, and then a couple months later, the, uh, the hospital system uh, came back to us and said, hey, you know, we actually want to uh, start to standardize this as a, as a kind of a way of incorporating alternative to pain or alternative to opiate pain strategies. Yeah. So you mean no uh, ketamine for your 70 and 80 year olds? So, Come yeah, on, yeah. David, man. Yeah, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Well, that's awesome. So what kind of results have you seen since starting this program? So, you know, at the bedside, you can see the results, you, you know, immediately. Uh, and so, you know, on a, on a non-scientific, non-studied basis, yeah, you, you know, you know, when you've got somebody uh, who's got great pain control um, and you don't need the you don't need the studies to tell you that. Yeah. But on a, on a, on a bigger level, we've had uh, some uh, aggregate data from our trauma registries that show that patients are having a drastic reduction in the amount of narcotics that they're needing, which has been correlating directly with length of stay uh, and complications associated with narcotics, typically like delirium, constipation, falls. Yeah. So do you have any numbers by chance for the decreased length of stay time, uh, by not using opiates for your patients? Mm. Pull it up. Yeah, Yeah. not a problem. I think it's just uh, interesting because I mean, especially right now we're in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, everyone's looking for ways to cut costs. And so, you know, anything that can save money or time for patients, you know, minimize exposure, especially, Generally, our patients that are coming in with hip fractures are elderly. They're going to be at higher risk. A lot of them have comorbidities. And so, you know, the shortest amount of time that you can keep them in the hospital and get them back out into the community, you know, is definitely going yeah. to be the best for them. Yeah. So we've got, uh, we, before we did the program, we, we had data from uh, three months or th- three months where, um, where we had length of days, uh, five, seven, and six average. Uh, and adverse re- reaction rates, um, 17, 42, and 33%. Um, after the initiation of the block protocol, that went down, the length of stay went down to what it looks like about four days. Um, so maybe like plus or minus a day to two days yeah. difference. Okay. Um, and then complication rate, yeah, complication rate went down to 7%. Fantastic. Uh, which, so was, which is fantastic. Just rough yeah. numbers off the top of my head. So you said 17, 42, and 30 something percent, right? before like yeah, before so yeah you can probably maybe so like an average yeah. of 25 30 percent ish so down to seven percent that, that yeah. is phenomenal yeah. that is and amazing. again those aren't those aren't studied numbers those aren't publishable numbers yeah. but that's kind of generic yeah. yeah but definitely notable this noticeable difference yeah excellent now what about buy-in from your team so obviously you've been interested in ultrasound since residency you know um, i don't know if i'd mentioned it earlier but you approached your group to be the ultrasound director Um, you know, kind of build things out, business model, what it would look like, what it would take, how to support, you know, your role as director. And so you've had the initiative. So how did you get your providers on board and help them be able to implement this into their practice? Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a bit of moving a mountain because our group, uh, like I think a lot of community groups, is built up of uh, new docs who are uh, facile with using ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Um, some docs who are uh, comfortable using ultrasound in some applications, and then some docs who really don't use ultrasound at all. Um, yeah. They're they're literally uh, capable of doing a fast exam, and that's about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we've got that kind of three tiered um, level in our group. And so I I essentially uh, through a several several episodes of um, uh, teaching sessions, uh, we we got this rolled out, and it's been a couple of years and. And it rolled out slowly, and uh, and people gradually became more comfortable with it as they got more and more comfortable doing the blocks. Uh, the the biggest thing I saw dif- with the difficulty is one is understanding that a large volume anesthetic can can be dangerous. Uh, you do have to ca- mm-hmm. calculate some some numbers in some folks. Um, that that gave some folks some pause, and um, and then just uh, the first block, getting them to do that first yeah. block, it's like taking Absolutely. the training wheels off. Yeah. You know, and once they once they get that done, then they're then the, the training wheels come off and they're ready to go. Yeah, that leap of faith. So, but they they were happy. That's awesome. So, do you have very many APPs at your site by chance, nurse practitioners or physician assistants? Yeah, we work closely with APPs. Okay, awesome. Um, just out of curiosity, do any of them perform the blocks, or have you uh, you know implemented any sort of protocol with them? Because a lot of APPs, at least where I've been you know, haven't had, uh, you know, had minimal, if any at all, ultrasound training in the past. And, you know, they're eager to learn. Um, so what's been your experience with the APPs in ultrasound? 
Yeah, our APPs are more eager to learn than our docs, which which yeah. is you know, that's I think what I've seen too, <laughs> for yeah, sure. It's just it's just a new, it's so new, and they they want to be involved. Uh, and then um, and so we do. Our our protocol currently is that they are unable to do it independently. Okay, but, gotcha. Uh, anytime anytime I can pull somebody in, um, I'll let them do it, and I'll supervise or I'll I'll you know be a part of it, but I'll let them do it to try to you know build that out and I'll let them learn yeah so so not quite see one do one teach one but you know working working them in there they could some could do it that way yeah. but just uh, by the by laws and the regulations we're able to do that yeah point. for sure well that's awesome and then uh, just really quick do you know what percentage of your patients are getting fascia iliaca blocks in the ed that have hip fractures uh, a very high number um so at, one 50, our, at one of our one of our sites yeah so one of our sites 100 oh, percent um, wow that's unless awesome unless there's a contraindication yeah yeah um and then most other sites uh what we have right now is a partnership with anesthesia mm -hmm. so that if we are one unable to do it um, based on time constra constraints or if the provider's un uncomfortable doing it we can call anesthesia's back, back up so that they can get that block uh within three hours of presentation of yeah ED. That's, that is phenomenal. Um, well, congratulations on that. I know it's, it's not easy building a program. I've done it before. I was the director in Cincinnati for a while, building from the ground up. And, you know, there are a lot of obstacles and barriers you encounter. But, you know, once you get things going, it's, it's really helpful for the patients especially. Yeah. So, excellent. Well, th well, thanks, David. I appreciate it. And then um, I've actually seen some of the resources that you have to do your education for your providers to train them. And you have protocols in place and actually, you know, have kits that you put together. So everything's in one place. So it's all protocolized, makes it easier. Like you said, you know, the volumes are in there, so they're not having to, you know, look it up. It's all right there. Uh, would you mind by chance if we went ahead and shared some of that information with the community to be able to help build up their uh, ultrasound programs and potentially start a fascia iliaca block program? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's, it's so easy to do once, once the work's done from the back end, sharing it's, uh, is a no-brainer. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you yeah. so much. So we'll go ahead and put those in the show notes. Uh, I'll kind of concise it down into you know a protocol and the materials that, that David's used up at his site. And uh, we really appreciate your your work that you're doing. And um, I know that's something they're looking at doing at our hospital system. And you know being able to piggyback off your work is extremely helpful. So so thank you for that, David. Yeah, of course. All right, awesome. Well, before we end the interview, we've got a couple of questions for the hot seat. Are you all right answering a few questions before we let you go? I'm ready to go. All right, perfect. So question number one, what is your favorite ultrasound application that you like to use? By far, echocardiogram. Echo, nice. All right, why is that? Uh, echo coupled with an IVC, uh, it gives me so much information in somebody who is... Uh, hypotensive or shocky uh, and lets me kind of tailor individualized care to them instead of just throwing a bunch of fluids and pressors at somebody. So. Fair enough. Yeah. It, it is a little bit sexier than looking at abscesses with yep. ultrasound. I will definitely give you that. All right. Nice. So uh, what is the coolest case that you've seen in your, in your career as a physician using point of care ultrasound or the most recent case, either one? Uh, the one the best comes to, to mind is a uh, lady came in and just didn't feel well, a little bit lightheaded, and uh, kind of got triaged to the you know, the back back corner. And uh, when she was hypotensive, a couple minutes later, I did echo, and she had a McConnell sign, which was the oh, first nice. time I ever seen really yeah. a McConnell sign. And uh, and and so based on that, I got her right to CT. Had the huge PE, and we was able to kind of direct care based yeah. on that. But it really expedited her management. All right, awesome, awesome. All right. Now, what is the greatest challenge that you've had to face coming from the community? And this can be, you know, personally, you know, what, what's difficult for you to use ultrasound at the bedside or as a program director or with your group? What's what's the biggest hurdle that you've had to face? I think it's just getting people to uh, understand that you know, ultrasound can be used independently at the bedside without having to order another ultrasound study. Yes. Um, it takes buy-in from surgeons. It takes some some trust from surgeons, but if, uh, if I can do an ultrasound of an appendicitis in a three-year-old, four-year-old kid, I don't need another one, uh, or the same thing goes with the gallbladder. And so getting other yeah. folks to be that confident, or at least, uh, start to do the scans and then not, you know, trust the results and not order a consultative study. Uh, that's a challenge. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I could see that for sure. It definitely takes effort coordinating with other specialties as well. Like you yeah. said, you know, surgery, 
or GI or, you know, anybody else OB potentially, depending on what you find. Yeah. All right, excellent. So, last question. If you were stranded on a desert island and you could only take one ultrasound machine with you, which machine would it be? Well, I would have to say the Sonosite Export uh, because it's my it's my main machine and uh, and Sonosite is uh, you know who we who we use at most of our hospitals for everything. So it's the one I've been I've been growing up on. Fair enough. So I was born and raised on Sonosite as well, so I can. I can relate to that. I use the export. It's an awesome machine. Nice to be able to wipe everything down. Those buttons are knobs, especially now. Uh, you know, yep. infection control is a big issue. Being able to just wipe every surface down. And yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, David, thank you so much for coming onto the show with us this week. Of course. And uh, you know, sharing all the knowledge that you've got and the resources that you have. And uh, before we let you go, are there any? Um, you know, how can people get a hold of you? Do you have a Twitter account or, you know, any other sort of social media account that people could, you know, follow you and learn more from you? I do, but I rarely check it. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I, try to, I try to stay off as much as I can. Yeah. My email is probably my easiest way to, to get a hold of me. And I do, I do respond to direct emails, uh, you know, uh, like, like with the Texas program, they emailed me and I was flying down there two months later to teach their whole group. So that works. And it's, uh, Bosch D at USACS.com. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, David. And thank you for your time and for coming on the show. Uh, be safe, take care, and keep scanning, my friend. Will do. Thanks for having me. All right. Man, that was an awesome interview. Thanks again to David for coming on the show and taking time away from his family to help us out in the community. I hope you got a lot of takeaways out of that. I know I did. And I will make sure to put a, a Cliff Notes version of David's protocol as well as a safe dosage card that you can use for the anesthetics used in fascia iliaca blocks. We'll put a link to those in the show notes. And on the next podcast episode, we'll do a deeper dive into how to perform the fascia iliaca block or femoral nerve block, tips and tricks, and some of the evidence from literature to support use in the emergency department. And as always, every shift, get out there and do one scan. It will change your practice and it will affect your patients' lives. So until next time, keep scanning my brothers and sisters in ultrasound. We are committed to serving you, our community ultrasound brothers and sisters. If you find this podcast to be of great value, please subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, and leave us a review. If you have a request, you can email the show at communitysoundwaves at gmail.com, and that is all one word. Follow us on Twitter at Community Soundwaves. Stay healthy and be safe. I don't always use ultrasound, but when I do, it makes a difference. Keep scanning, my friends.